Welcome back to another episode of the Twisted Tubs podcast. I am your host, Stephen Tubberty, a.k.a. Twisted Tubs. He is Baz, Barry Fahey, a.k.a. Being Baz. You can catch him on YouTube and all of the socials. Baz, thank you very, very much for coming on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. And always a pleasure to be here, Tubbs. Uh, very well, much. I, I live here now, so always a pleasure to be here, but also a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> no problem. And I mean, like, to be fair, it's been one of those things where every one of, like, we've all been we've all been con- uh, constantly talking throughout the last year and stuff, but we haven't actually physically met up a lot or, if, or, or, or at all. Yeah, I think of- we, we saw each other for like half a day in like a small window of like not lockdown, which yes. was nice. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I mean, it is that thing, isn't it? Because like, you know, I remember, and it was obviously, you know, a few episodes back, I was just talking about like, you know, like, creativity within 2020 and things like that and and i was even just and it, even saying it out loud going oh man yeah you know i haven't been on a film set in just over a year and i'm going oh my god i haven't been on a film set in over a year yeah like, mad that's crazy it. it is insane for a guy who was pumping out films like nobody's business <laughs> i mean i'm brian o'regan you know brian he does that youtube the uh, joe show <laughs> and he, he, we were talking about it and i was even saying that like I was going. I was so close to that fifty, to that number that I had in my head. That means absolutely nothing to nobody else in the yeah. entire world. But myself, <laughs> it's this goal number that I've put in my brain, and I will get there. Though we will all get back to it. I don't. I do not doubt it. No, God, no. I mean, it's it once once it's physical enough for us to be out and it's safe and stuff again. Then I will be, I will be blonding my hair up and doing whatever I need to do for the roles <laughs> that I, I I want to get into. You know, but I um, love it. Um, as I said, I'm delighted you came on. But um, as I said, we normally, as I said, when I start off these these interviews, um, I normally start off with basic questions, whatever. But the first question I normally ask is, um, Barry Fahey, what is your origin story? And by what I mean by origin story is, as I said, it's just how you ended up on the road, you know, to becoming, you know, like um, just basically like a skateboarder music joy into music like and um, you're like a filmmaker and then just you know, directing your own stuff writing your own stuff and you know just going as a filmmaker in general and then in in 2021 you know as i said we don't have to go back to like you know vipers or so on but you know i mean just the origin story that is barry fahey and how it got him to where he is today well in 1992 i was bitten by a radioactive camera and since then i uh once a year, I grow a lens, and then that becomes my new lens. <laughs> and what's your new lens called now, Bess? Uh Hubert. Hubert. Because <laughs> for anyone that's watching the show, um, Barry Fahey has, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, has um, literally named every single camera you've owned, right? I've named every single camera I own, but I go one step further. I have named everything that I own. Uh, like okay. everything of, of, of value to me, like a- anything that I have an emotional connection to is named after a Marvel character. So uh, uh, I just recently got an Apple watch. Uh, my Apple watch is named Veronica uh, after the Hulkbuster. Nice. Uh, my, my phone is Tony Stark. My computer over there, that's the Hulk. Uh, my car is Bucky Barnes because, you know, he's my sidekick. So uh, yeah, I named pretty much pretty much everything. So was it very wrong of me to have called your car when I we did briefly meet each other in in, in the last few months um, to call it the Batmobile? Because I mean, I'm assuming I kind of like crossed Hallowed Brown on that one. It, and no, no, not at all. Like I, I, it's still complimented to be the Batmobile, considering the technology that's in it and whatnot. Oh, but um, yeah, it's it's. It's pretty amazing. I love my car. <laughs> I love your car. <laughs> when I found out your car had Netflix, I loved it more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, everything, everything is Marvel characters. It's like uh, my camera is like the, the one that I'm using for net for this uh, is Jessica Jones. Cause it's a photography camera. That just makes sense. Nice. My red Scarlet dragon is uh, Wanda Maximoff. Uh, and my new red, the small one is uh, Shuri. <laughs> I, I, man, I love that there's these there's these names placed upon them, and and it looks like there's thought and 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 stuff gone into who like what name is applied to which which um job thing. Yeah, well. usually usually I'll go as far as like putting uh, a list together of like potential names, and then if I can't decide, I usually message Paddy and I'm like, so these are my list. What what way what way are you leaning? 
Uh, but even like my one wheel, you know, the, my electric skateboard, uh, that's called the Milano because, you know, Star-Lord, why not? <laughs> <laughs> my drone, when I got the drone, I called Yaka after uh, Yondu's arrow. Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I like naming things. <laughs> you know, come here, Wancho, as I've always said, right? Because look, come here, look at, look at these things behind me. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm, I'm a massive nerd. You're, you're a massive nerd at heart. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, if you, if obviously outside of our bubble and someone's like, why do you name things? And like, you were like, don't judge him for naming things. Do you know what I mean? Naming things is good. You know, you own these things. You should name them. <laughs> yes. It's, I think, uh, it, yeah. I find it, if you're passionate enough about something, you will name it. And yeah. uh, I've always named my cameras. And it's funny because I, I had a black magic pocket 4k camera uh and that was the only camera i never named and it was only dawning on me when i was selling it it was like i have no emotional attachment to this camera like you know my my red is like the first red i ever owned you know the first big camera i ever owned was actually it was a black magic but not that one and i named that that was thanos and you know like everything had a name and a purpose but then i realized like way later that one i never named that one and i was like oh i guess i just I never really felt emotionally attached to that one. So that's why it was easier sell. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, I mean, I remember it was the, the, the DJI Osmo. Yes. That, um, that I yes. purchased after yourself. Like, and I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things is where like, I mean, I was, I used to look at it. It was like, oh, that's just another camera. Do you know, if I need to get rid of it, I get rid of it. I have went to sell that thing seven times, best, And every time it comes out, I'm going, Oh, I can't because I know I'll use this for something you know, big. Yeah. And every time I say it, I end up using it for a video. I end up using yes. it for something. Um, and I've, I've started using it a lot more as well lately. Good. Because, you know, Good. obviously I'm at home. So I'm starting to like just, we can't go out. Obviously we can, but you know, we can't go out in, in, in the way we used to and the capacity that we, we were uh, accustomed to. Um, so yeah. yeah, so I'm learning different things, picking up uh, little bits and pieces like yourself and everyone else's. But uh so yeah, so like, I mean, since we're all at home and everything else, we're not getting on film sets. So like, you know, we started kind of like messing around with the cameras and, you know, like um, obviously with music and, and stuff like that. What, um, what was the, like, what was the time frame and what was the thing that kind of pushed you in the direction? So like when you picked up a camera and decided that that was, that was going to be your, like your lane going forward. Yeah. Like, um, I guess it, it all it all stems from music. Like music was the big thing for me. Um, when I when I started school, I came from a really small like class. We only had like four people in my sixth class, and uh, I ended up being the only one. Uh, there was two of us that went to one school and two of us that went to another. Um, but we ended up kind of splitting up, and um, I ended up like weaseling my way into like a, an already established friends group who were all musicians. I was like, oh my God, you guys, I'm just like getting into music. I'm just gone through like my, my Linkin Park and my Limp Biscuit phase. And, you know, they, they're t telling me about these other bands that I've never heard of, like In Me. And uh, I had heard of System of a Down. Anything that was on like Kerrang or Scuzz at the time, yeah. uh, that was pretty much what I knew. But they had like a whole other uh, mishmash of stuff I've never heard of. And I weaseled my way into that friend group and I started like playing instruments in the background. But what really kind of like tipped me over the edge is uh, one of the guys, Connor, started skateboarding. He bought a skateboard and I was like, oh my God, he's doing all these really cool tricks. And I was like, I wonder, could I do that? And we, there became a big group of us in Loch Ray, uh, Brian, uh, Cubal, Connor, uh, Jake, and we all used to hang out and skate together. Uh, but it was always like music that kind of tied us all together. So when we went to to college, me and Connor actually ended up living together. So we ended up starting a band. Uh, it was a cover band. Our lead singer's name was Mike. So we called ourselves Grab the Mic, which was fun. <laughs> um, <love> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, we used to do covers and stuff like that. We used to play in uh, the Keys in Galway. And then it wasn't really... Uh, uh, like a passion passion until uh, I met uh, Liam, Michelle, Damien and Brian and we started Which Way to Egypt and that was like an originals band so we were all writing our own music uh, 
and we were writing our own music and we kind of played a couple of Battle of the Bands and that all went really well. And then we got like a shitty Dell laptop and we we're like, let's record our own music. And we had a program called Magix Software. I don't know if anyone remember ever... that. Yeah, I know, right? I do. <laughs> it, was, it was awful, but it was great. Uh, so we used to like record our own stuff with that. And then I got to this idea in my head. It was like, let's make a music video. It's like, I can get a camera and we can make a music video. Like we have the songs. Let's, let's go make a music video. And from there, it really became like a looking up and learning anything I could online about making a music video, what type of camera I should get, uh, everything like that, uh, straight to the internet. And that's when I came across Film Riot. Uh, shout out Ryan Connolly, you hero. Um, oh, we love you. <laughs> so Ryan essentially taught me everything I know about making films. Uh, it, it, and again, this is going back 10, 12 years. Uh, think about it, man. Which is crazy. Like, and I came across film right back then. I still remember like the old intro where Ryan would say, uh, you want to be a filmmaker? Me too. Let's figure it out. And it was the... And, the Spielbergian kind of like Jurassic Park effects and things yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, there was always Jurassic Park. Again, something else that me and him very much have in, in common is uh, love of Jurassic Park. Uh, but yeah, it, it was way back when it, I just, I never, I didn't find content on the internet like it because not only was it educational and taught me stuff that I wanted to know, it was funny as all hell. Oh, yeah. And uh it was just so entertaining on top of being really good education content. And I learned pretty much everything that I knew at that stage from him. Um, you, you want to know what my favorite early skit from the, uh, from film riot is. Do you remember on. the Ford Fiesta skit they met? Oh my God. Yeah. That was yeah, so it was good. When he just like Ryan is like, there's like weirdo that comes up to the car and just jumps in and just start kind of just going, uh, it, I, it, man, to this day, it makes me giggle and laugh. But the, segwaying back to what you were saying, sorry, about the cameras, Bess, and you said yes. oh, you wanted to make a music video and get st stuck in. What was the first camera you ever used? Because mine was a Super AF VHS. The first camera I ever used. So that's a funny story. Me and my cousins used to steal my father's video camera, like an old tape recorder, and we used to film sketches. Oh. Uh <laughs> And like, they were so bad. They were awful, but they were so funny. I wonder if those tapes still around. I must look for them. <laughs> but uh, that was the first like filming that we used to do. Uh, but the when I got into music and later on down the line and started thinking about making music videos, I got a like a, a Handycam. Uh, like a, I don't think it was a Sony Handycam, but it was, it was a, a digital camera. And it had- Hard drive built in. Yes, hard drive built yeah, in, 30 was, gigabytes. <laughs> I think um, I think we shot. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm pretty sure whoever was involved in Illusions will correct me. And um, but when we shot Illusions of the Mind, it was myself and it was Mark Prendergast's mm -hmm. camera that I that I borrowed for about two years. Um, yeah. <laughs> to make this movie, so it was it was so many handy cams when you think back. Yeah, and that's it. And that was like the first camera that I bought. It had like 30 gigs internal memory. I think it would record for like two hours or something like that i don't think it like it wasn't even hd or anything like that it was it was pretty bog standard but it, it did the trick it uh it taught me everything i knew about like like because obviously it didn't have like shallow depth of field like not like this where you have like really nice kind of like focus and and out of focus areas it's it, it was nothing like that it was it was all flat image so it, it taught me a lot about like lighting makes a big difference and it taught me a lot about what what you put in the frame and where makes a difference so uh i had that for about three years uh until i could like get a job and afford something better uh and then i actually bought this is a funny story tubs you don't know this one at all yeah. i decided i wanted to upgrade from what i had so i had like uh, uh, mini DV tapes. My dad had a mini DV camera, so I got mini DV tapes because they were high definition at the time. And I was like, okay, but I have these tapes. Can I get a camera that's better quality than the one I have that takes these tapes? I went and researched online 
I found the camera that they made 28 Days Later with, which was a Canon XL2. Uh, I found it on eBay, uh, went out and bought it. It was the coolest camera I ever had. It was phenomenal. The only problem is I got it on eBay and it was broke. So, what? yeah, it would record onto the tapes, but the tapes kept like skipping and you kept getting scan lines and stuff like that. Yeah. And it would like jump frames and back and forth. So it wasn't recording right. To this day, I wish I kept it because it looked class. It's just such an amazing looking camera. And the fact that like, that's like a prosumer camera that they shot 28 days later on, it was like, oh, why didn't I keep it? I should have kept it. It wasn't, it wasn't the exact one, it was, but it was that model that they shot on. I still um, have upstairs is the, um, the JVC Super 8 Flatbed. Um, nice. It's, it's still up in, up in the press um, upstairs, but it's, it's the one with the big, I don't know, bef- before, because you were saying it's like the tapes would have obviously like shrunk in size over time. Yeah. You know? But these were the fat bass tapes. They were like, you had v- VHS and then you had these tapes. Yeah. Then later on, we ended up with a Sony camera that would play the 8 mil tapes. And then we ended nice. up on HD, um, you know, they had, or they had Sony Handicams in, onto Canon and, and didn't see all the stuff you, you were working with. Was, and I was kind of, because I remember, I think I used to do it on set, but where I just walk up to you and kind of, I, I'd randomly ask you questions. Yeah. So I was completely <laughs> blown away. Because I've been I've been working on films and stuff for years, but I mean, but to see, because obviously, do you know what I mean? I think with Celtic Badger and the way it worked was, is like you came with a knowledge of of, of cameras and, and and lighting, and and then Paddy um, had a knowledge of of directing. I had I had done directing, but it was like everyone kind of had a a different bit of knowledge to bring to the table, and it was a really good kind of thing. But every time I saw you kind of like do your thing, I was going, how do I make my camera? <laughs> you know, yeah. I was well, well I mean, that's that's the thing, though. I I always called like Celtic Badger Media a filmmaking co-op because it's not like it's not one person who's out to make something and then everyone else supports it. It's it's like you want to make something. It's like cool. Let's get resources together and let's make that. And you know, Patty wants to make something. Let's gather resources and do that. Or Regan wants to make something. Let's gather resources and do that. You know, like. And everyone brought something, as you said, something else to the table and everyone learned from each other and everyone got better because of it. Like there was no one who came in as like an absolute walk in the park superstar who knew everything about everything. Oh God, no. Like I, I knew a lot about cameras and I knew a lot about lighting, but uh, after working with Paddy, it was like, I realized that it's not just, your story isn't just go, you go from A to B. It's, you you go it to A and you meet a character and that character takes you from there to, to B, you know? And and Paddy taught me so much about like character development and why characters say certain things. And the I'll never forget the first time I read the script for the three don'ts. And on the page, it was so clear that each character had their own dialect and their own kind of words that they used that other characters didn't use. And I was like, I know there's like maybe 10 characters in this, but each one of them is so distinct. I can see it on the page and I'd never experienced that before. So I, yeah, I, I, he, brought, it, it he brought something else. <laughs> no, it, it genuinely is. I totally agree with it because, um, I, and I think that's why when I write my own stuff, I think that's why I, I kind of always end up falling into the role of the character I wrote because, you know, you write it a certain way. And then, I mean, yeah. that's just my, my process and my, my, how I do the, the, the writing thing, but I, I, I still haven't been able to distinguish, like I can write other characters for other people and all the characters will seem different. Do you know, they won't seem like the same person. Um, but it's, it's, it's always like they have one character. It's mm. like a mirror image of me heightened up to 11. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and the reason moving on to another question I had for you actually was, and it's in the filmmaking um, uh, genre as well. It's about, you growing as because we were talking about you know learning so it's a perfect segue into the next question about growing as a filmmaker and learning like the craft and then eventually getting to make your own like your own movie that came from your head from the page and onto screen which by the way to give you props is a fantastic movie which well, boy racer i assume we're talking boy about it's yeah. just <laughs> such a sweet it's a sweet film dude it really is and i really enjoyed Thanks, it dude I know. I think I might have like said it in text or something, but you know, just to 
since I'm in front of you right now, it's like it, I was actually very, very entertained. It was such a sweet film. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, Boy Racer is kind of like uh, basically the pinnacle of what I've kind of learned over the last 12 to 13 years. Uh, like it took a lot of um, trial and error. I've, I've made a couple of other short films like... Um, Please Forgive Me and a couple of 48 hour film competitions. And each one of those was kind of like a, a technical exercise. Like Please Forgive Me was, was by all means a technical exercise because I had camera gear and I had a steady cam and I was like, can we just make a film in one shot? But from working with like Paddy and the rest of the guys, it was like, well, I can't just make a film in, in one take without a reason. So I built the story off the reason for the technical exercise. So <laughs> I, uh, I thought, it, okay, if you're going to watch a movie in one take, it has to be in real time. And what's the worst thing to be, you know, or the most entertaining thing to watch in real time is someone who doesn't know they're in a movie and you're kind of like, you're seeing more than what they're seeing and you're getting tense because you can't escape it. There's no cuts to go away from it. There's nothing like that. But um, Boy Racer stemmed from, uh, it was actually um, Aperture, the lighting company that I use for pretty much all my lights. I think I have one other light that is not Aperture. <laughs> but uh, Aperture were running a competition called Light This Location, which was essentially a competition where you were only allowed in one location and you had to use lighting to tell your story. So, one so location and lighting. One location and lighting. They were the two key elements. Um, so I started talking to V, my wife, and we were chatting away and we we're like, okay, so we have to either use lights in a really, really creative, fun way or have an amazing location. So I started going down the, like, can we rent a castle or can we, you know, look at this and look at that. And V just said, well, why don't you use, you know, your, the shed at your home house you know, like where your dad has the cars and stuff. And um, I was like, Sorry. oh yeah, it's like, you know, that's a, a big location, but you know, what, what can you tell out of it? And she was like, well, why don't you use the cars and tell a story with the cars? And then we kind of spitballed for a while and she came up with the idea then of like, having a race where the car doesn't actually move. And I was like, Oh, that's such a great idea. And like really took me back to when I was a kid and like making up all these stories. And we used to go out, me and my sister used to go out into the field next door and we'd have like sticks and we would cut down the nettles cause we were pirates or whatever. Oh, I, I love it dude, because I was that kid. I just was <laughs> yeah. like... So it took me back to that. And then I was like, Oh, what if he like imagined a race in his head and then, you know, it turns out that it wasn't happening. He didn't go anywhere. And that way we kind of got best of both worlds. We got like a cool location, a really interesting prop, and we got to play with light. So um, that was pretty cool. And yeah, Boy Racer is my most successful film to date. I um, uh, I actually won a runner-up prize in the Light This Location competition. So uh, a whole bunch of aperture gear and deity microphones and a couple of like extra things like... Um, the odd, uh, oh, I was going to say audacity, but it's not audacity. Cut that bit. Uh, uh, <laughs> what's the name of the, the show? <laughs> what's the name of the music service that I use? Oh, Patty, Patty is screaming at me right now. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember. Damn it. No, come here. It's all good. It's all good. It's a software you use to produce music and it's, stuff, right? It's, it's a music licensing company. Uh, Artlist. 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 Uh, it's a music license company. So I, I actually won a free year oh, for boys. that. <laughs> and that was a company that I was using anyway. Uh, yes. So I, I really love their stuff already. Uh, but yeah, I won a whole bunch of stuff. It really, like, it took what I had and elevated it to the next level uh, from that. And it also had a massive uh, festival run. I think we played... Uh, 18 festivals throughout the world. We won 13 different awards, including best five minute film, best children's film, uh, audience awards, participate, uh, audience awards, and 
um, best film of the festivals on different different festivals, uh, which was pretty amazing. It's pretty cool. And then to finish out its life, um, I actually ended up selling it uh, through uh, donate.ie. Um, so anyone who donated money to the Irish Cancer Society and the uh, Galway Hospice, uh, and I ended up raising, uh, I think it was 800 quid each. So 1600 euros for, uh, both of those. And now it's out there for everyone to see on the internet. And they can see it where, Buzz? Uh, they can see it on the Celtic Badger Media YouTube channel. And I do recommend, because obviously it's Baz's movie, but I'm, I'm a friend of Baz's that has obviously seen it and it is genuinely really, really well, worth uh, checking out. It's as I, as I said before, it's, we do a lot of horror and action and kind of psychological mm-hmm. movies and comedies and stuff. This was just the straight up, it's a sweet movie. It's like That's yeah. what I felt watching it. This is just, and not just, actually, you know, I was going to say something with Mark's part, but I won't because it spoiled the movie. Yeah. But, um, but there's a lovely scene in it, um, which actually really kind of cements the movie. And I completely agree. I think that, you know? that, that scene makes the movie. It, it's, it's the glue that hides it all together. And it's it like, oh. Such an amazing scene. And Mark was such a great cast for it. And he was just so genuine on the day that it just played really well. And yeah, he's an absolute gent for being it. I mean, I mean, I, I, and obviously, you know, like Mark has been in like the three don'ts and the world as mm-hmm. I see it well. And, and it's crazy that like Mark came in to work like on the three don'ts and he eventually worked on the world as I see it. And I have known Mark over 20 years practically and that was the first time we'd ever been on screen together in, I mean. uh, in the world as I see it. It. yeah really never, we'd never been on screen together we were in the dorms but we if you remember we we crossed paths but not on screen yeah that's and, interesting and that would never have happened and i know this for sure it would never have happened if not for being a part of that celtic badger bubble absolutely we're kind of bringing everyone together and and it is it, and, and you look at it but i mean I mean, but that's the question I think I was I was asking you in general there was like just um just in you know, looking at like, you know, since all of this started, because obviously you would have started before Celtic Badger and you were doing shorts mm-hmm. and it's your own pieces and stuff, but just see the body of work you've created since the journey began in the film side of things and it's it's fantastic. You know what uh, I mean, thanks, man. About it? Well like I mean it's it's one of those things that every single film you do, even if it's everything you do is a learning curve. You, you should take away something from every film. Yeah. I've worked on films that haven't been great, but I've been like, that actor is class. I'm going to fucking bank that and he's going to come in on something else down the line. Or, you know, like even the old stuff that I used to make, like I used to do the Monday challenges for Film Riot and they were just yeah. like, they were like shitty VFX shots and stuff like that. But then I learned stuff for that for when we were doing the don'ts. It was like, oh, that made that way better and stuff like that. So everything, everything is a stepping stone to get to the next level. Even sometimes it's a massive leap from here to here. And then sometimes it's like a small step, but everything should be a step up. Look, Amir, I've always said it. I think, I think you've heard me say it over time as well as about baby steps, you know, as long Mm -hmm. as you're moving forward, you know, it doesn't matter at the pace, you know, you're, you will get to where you're meant to go eventually. It doesn't matter if you're sprinting or, or taking the baby steps. But as long as there's movement, then absolutely you'll be all right. You you'll get to where you need to go. You know, but um, but yeah. But so being a DOP in general, Baz, I mean, like I mean, is I I I've obviously you know I've done BTS video and I've kind of like I have shot sequences of my own stuff. Um, but to be like in charge, like the pressure. I think the question I'm asking is what's the what is the pressure of having the entire visual of that movie, like all the people that are there on, like in front of the camera, running around doing all the other jobs, the director over here. But what's the pressure of like you as the like the DOP having to nail the visual on all of the films that we do and movies you do going forward? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I guess like a lot of it comes down to in a lot of like big budget movies, the director of photography doesn't touch a camera. So they would just say, there needs to be a camera here. There needs to be a camera here. You need to be on this lens. You need to be in that lens and, and stuff like that. And they would, they would in the same way, the directs the actor, that's what they would do. But obviously we have a much condensed uh, workflow 
So more often than not, I'm also running camera. So that gives me like a lot of options, but I guess it's, it's really collaborative. Like I work with the director really closely about, uh, cause I can make, I can make anything look pretty, you know, and, and make it like a really nice looking frame, but it has to have a, a, a meaning and a story behind it because your job is to enhance the story that he, the director is trying to tell. So, um, it, it kind of comes down to like, what's the emotion in this? Like, what do you want the audience to feel? And that's kind of what boils down to where the lights go, what color clothes the characters are wearing for set deck and, you know, what kind of room this is and are they messy? Are they tidy? You know, all of these little things build up to make the audience feel a certain way. And then I guess as director of photography, my job is to kind of try and make those images as pleasing to the eye, even though they might be distressing. Uh, so that's a, that's a tough balance to, to play. Um, like there's, there's a lot of subtlety in what's done uh, in film to make an audience feel a certain way that most people don't even realize is happening. Like you could have uh, a character walk from right of screen to left of screen. Uh, that's, that's considered backwards actually. Now this is flipped. So you could have a character walk this way through screen, which is the opposite way of what you would consider normal. So you could have that symbolizing a character who's traveling backwards and not making the steps they need to go forward. Um, stuff like that. And then lighting is a big thing as well, depending on if a character's backlit, they're much more sinister. If they have really soft lighting, it's really kind of nice and romantic. If it's harsh lighting with a lot of shadows, it's, it's creepy or dangerous. And all those sort of things like all add up to, to getting that feeling across. Um, specifically talking about pressure, uh, it, it's, it's very collaborative. Like I will talk a lot with the director about what sort of style and feel they want. And then I'll try and, uh, you know, kind of mimic that or take my own spin on something that I've seen previously that made me feel that way. Um, one good example is actually uh, Retribution, uh, Paddy's short Retribution. Um, Paddy told me he wanted a, a very drive, uh, only God forgives the guest kind of feel. Um, but I had never seen those movies uh, at the at the time of <laughs> of uh, filming, so I watched all their trailers, and then uh, at, as we got to each spot, I was like, "Okay, how do you want this to feel?" And then we kind of talked angles and camera position uh, before each one. So Paddy doesn't realize, but he actually did a lot of the DOP work for that movie. I just did the fancy lighting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I have the same story about um, the world as I see it, as you, as you know. I mean, as you know, obviously, like, you know what I mean? Late in the game, I ended up stepping into the lead role and, mm -hmm. and, and ended up, like, being on camera. So... Um, Without Petty, like, I mean, I know, I know, like, I mean, obviously, you know what I mean? I would have had to be like on camera learning lines and kind of like making sure everything was kind of running. But if I didn't have Petty doing 3,000 jobs for me uh, that, that entire weekend, then, you know, that movie might not, like, you know, because I, it, it, as I say about pressure, then I probably would have felt the pressure kick in then. Mm. And I don't think I ever did because I think you, yourself i mean like even like when you look at bex and everyone they were all kind of everyone just jumped in and did their thing and that's why when i look at that movie now and even that goes into the post-production as well you know there was so many like there was so many like messages to yourself and messages to petty and then joe running off to dave joe and and i got to i mean i had made a feature film this and i had done all that legwork myself but to do mm -hmm. it you know what i mean in a group unit and to really feel that pressure kick as i don't yeah. think a lot of people see pressure that comes behind the scenes you know when, that, when the camera gets turned off and you and you go home because obviously you know you see the you see the pretty screen and you see the actors do their thing and but it does it does you know yourself you've done it yourself you've done it on and even films that you haven't physically directed you've mm -hmm. been very much involved in the post-production and um, so yeah so i mean to see all that like there's a lot of pressure that comes with it so i think yeah 
But uh, but I also think like that ties in very well to like Celtic Badger Media stuff because yeah. we we work as a unit. There's never any point where like I know I've worked on stuff where actors have been like, okay, well, cool. I'll see you in like three months or whenever it's done. And that's not how it goes with us. Like we always like tie in everything in together. It's like, do you need a hand with this? You know, it's like, I know for the majority of the post-production, me, Patty and Aaron kind of shouldered a lot of it, but of the three of us were always like cycling around each other. It was like, oh, do you need me to maybe edit this scene to get it out of your way and stuff like that? And we would always kind of go back and forth and like Patty would do a lot of, you know, the sound work and the sound design and stuff like that. So yeah, the, there is a lot more pressure that comes behind the scenes as well. But I think, yeah, if you're working with the right people, it makes all yeah. the difference. I mean, and, and I think that's, and that's why I kind of mentioned the word as I say it, because it, it was the right team. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I to completely really agree. Carry the weight that I, like the extra weight that I kind of put myself in, do you know what I mean? On mm-hmm. the day and stuff. I genuinely had that thing where I had you behind camera and it was very much a thing. And this is why I love working with you as well, man. It's like, I can say it to you, like, I mean, I don't even have to tell you, do you know what I mean? Like, as you said about Paddy with Retribution, it's very much a thing of like, you know, it needs to be green over on the left and we need this guy to come in here and just do this. And you and you already kind of like, all right, I, 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 fair, I, I have a fair idea of where to go and then it just comes alive. And and it has been that way, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm i the hyper, I, I'm very much the hyper guy on set. Like, you know, that's, yeah. That was that's my demeanor. I think it's built into my DNA. I mean, half the time, even when I try to shut it off, it doesn't get. But it, I think it's when it comes to game time, when it's time to actually like get in front of the camera and go, is is when I find my best focus and my best work. You know what yeah. I mean? And I think, I mean, obviously, you know what I mean. You work with cameras outside of film as well, but I, I I've seen, I've, I've been on set to see it, but when that camera's on, and that I've seen that focus go tunnel vision with you. Same as yeah. Paddy and everyone else, you know. But I mean, it, and as you said yourself, that is part of the whole concept of working with Celtic Badger and the team and, and doing your own craft and just being, you know, just being that in love with what you do. Because I don't think we would have done all of this for as long as we've all done it if there wasn't a love and passion attached. So I think the True. question I'm asking you here is because of the pandemic and everything, obviously, do you know what I mean? We've been dealing with, you know, like, you know, creativity and just trying to be able to get out and be creative because we're all creative people. But just going forward and stuff into like the big bad world that we're in right now. But you know, like finding ways to be creative in the future, just you know, in the direction in your head. Like, do you kind of do you have a, a roadmap, or are you just playing it day by day like everyone else? Uh, I'm kind of playing it day by day. I, I guess I'm in a lucky position that I also have a full time job. That's my okay. my thing. Like, I. I for the first lockdown, I had like a weird survivor's guilt that like nothing really changed for me. I still had like a routine. I still had my job. And I've seen so many people who were like out of work and didn't have anything. And like, even my wife had to, you know, close her business and stuff like that. And I had this really weird, like, I feel weird getting up and going to work in the morning because I know that there's people who don't have that luxury. Um, so yeah, I had I had this really weird survivor's guilt feeling that I just couldn't shake for months. It was like I felt guilty that I was going to work and stuff like that. It was it it was such a surreal feeling. Um I was lucky enough though that I did also get to do some shoots uh through different lockdowns. Um we got to do I actually got to do shoot a music video for Emma Langford. Uh I think it was around this time last year, so it was just before lockdown 1.0 i think uh i think it was the start of february so it was yeah literally just before uh all that craziness kicked off uh i got to shoot a music video just outside cork with um uh luna uh directed by connor healy who is an absolute legend love that man um and i got to do like a couple of other small bits and pieces we got to do a 48 hour film competition uh, myself and Paul Fitzgerald, we literally two man crewed the whole thing. Uh, There's only two of you on set for that. So the yeah, there was three of us in total. There was me, Paul, and V, uh, oh. my wife, and we all sat down the the night of and came up with the idea and the story. And then me and Paul went out and filmed it, and me and Paul edited it, and me and Paul directed it, and that was it. It was just the three of us. We literally one man band the whole thing. Um, to show though doesn't it and I mean 
as I said, I mean, I'm, I mean, I won't, I won't mention the name of the film or what it is because I know it hasn't gone out into the world yet. But the one, it's it's called Motionless. It's it's going through festivals. We've submitted to a bunch of festivals, so we're just waiting to hear hear back. Okay. But if you're if you're clever, you can find it uh, on Little Cinema Galway's uh, YouTube page. <laughs> Go looking, kids. Go looking for it. There you go. But, no, um, but even for ourselves, man, before the pandemic, when you look at it, um, I think it was the December before, like as I said, and it's another one I won't mention by name, obviously, because that hasn't gone out into the world yet either. But that was yes. very much a five-day shoot over two weekends. And yeah. We maybe between what, seven to nine, maybe, I'm around maybe seven people at max, an entire feature. Uh, yeah, I think about seven, yeah. yeah it's so really funny because... Like obviously the trajectory from like the perished being the most you know costly pro- production we've ever made, the most professional set we've ever run, having full video village, wireless audio, you know, a full prosthetic makeup, you know, everything that was in that film, and then we stripped it all the way back down for that other project, and and like this was even further back it's like it these things can be done on your own but but it makes things more difficult it's the same same thing that i tell to everyone who was like what camera should i buy for making movies i'm like whatever camera you can get because the the thing with cameras is the more expensive they get the easier they make your job they don't they're not necessarily better cameras they don't shoot better footage because you can take a camera that's worth six grand and you can take a camera that's worth 60 euros and you can put them side by side. And if you light it and if you tell a good story, nobody will say, what camera was that shot on? They'll say that was class. So as uh, you said, it's visual. Like it's, it's the sound you have to get right. Yeah. They're, 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 a, they're a tool essentially. And the more expensive it is, the easier that tool makes the job, but it's still a tool. Like you can get the same job done with a, uh, a fork that you can with a spanner. It's just, it's more difficult to do with a fork. It's done, but it can, it's, you know, it's way easier. That is the best analogy for it I've ever heard in my life, actually, by yeah. the way. I fucked that spanner up. I think it was like, it was, it was supposed to be like, you can put a screw in wood with a hammer or a screwdriver. You know, both tools will get the job done, but one of them is going to be way easier than the other. Yeah. No, no, it's true. It's true. But, um, no, no, come here. I mean, and as I said, it's just, I mean, I'm, we're coming to near the, the, the end of the interview here, by yep. ways, but um, is there, like, as I said, is there anything else you want to add to it or is it just like, as I said, you can plug whatever you need to plug because, you know, this is what we're here for. But no, uh, in general. Actually, but, yeah, I will, I will plug my Instagram. I'm actually, uh, it, as part of what you were saying about trying to stay creative, at the start of 2021, I decided to do a photograph a day on Instagram. So, Uh, specifically trying to learn uh, like better techniques with my DSLR uh, to learn Lightroom, which is for processing photos that I'd never used before. And just, yeah, just trying to, I guess, instead of, because still photos and video are two very different beasts. They have a lot of the same principles, but they're very different Uh, because in video, you can rely on, somebody's movement or camera movement to get an emotion across. Whereas still photography, you're relying on one single image to tell your entire story. So it takes a different way of thinking about things and stuff like that. So I have been doing a photo a day. I think as of today, I'm on day 47 or 48. (laughs) Um, So every single day this year, since 2021 started, I've put up a new photo on my Instagram. So Bloody awesome, dude. And what's, yeah. the, what's the Instagram? Being Baz? Uh, being Baz underscore. I underscore think. Being Baz. No, Being Baz underscore. Okay, listen to the man. He knows he's on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> being Baz underscore. Um, very, very good. Because well, Being Baz was taken on Instagram. Rats. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, sadly, we are at the end of it. So we're going to have to just say our goodbyes now, which I, I'm so sick of because I don't think we covered everything we could have talked about. So would you be up for coming back on in another episode? Absolutely, man. Looking forward yeah. to it. Brilliant. All right. So at least, at least, as I said, anything we missed here, we can we can catch up and talk about again and cover and, and fill in the blanks and all those plot holes that are in the movies, you know? Um, 100%. <laughs> 100%. Baz, thank you very much for coming on the Twisted Tubs podcast. I am your host, Stephen Tubbley, a.k.a. Twisted Tubs. 
He is Bez, Barry Fahey, a.k.a. Being Bez. You can check him out on social media and YouTube. Thank you very much for listening to us. We have had a blast. Thank you, and we will see you very, very soon. Thanks, Dubs. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.